Welcome to the Secrets of the Bible Channel. Imagine a forgotten time, long before the storms and waters that shaped the earth as we know it. In the first chapters of the Bible, especially the book of Genesis, we are transported to a world that transcends familiarity, an era before the flood that would transform the face of humanity. These accounts, often shrouded in mysteries and profound interpretations, reveal a time of primitive humanity characterized by extraordinary longevity, intense divine connections, and an intimate proximity to the Creator, where the very story of creation unfolded before our ancestors. Notable characters like Adam, Eve, Cain, Abel, and the eventual hero Noah give us glimpses into a life that seems relatable. Numerous forces unite to cause the Flood, Satan, and the fallen angels. The first event that led to the Flood occurred before the creation of the world. That event was the creation of the children of God. In the biblical story of the book of Job, God reveals an event that occurred before the creation of the world. According to Job 38 verses 4 to 7, where were you when I laid the foundations of the earth? Let me know if you have understanding, who determined its measurements, if you know, or who stretched the line over it. On what are its foundations founded, or who laid its cornerstone, when the morning stars sang together joyfully, and all the children of God rejoiced. It is revealed that angelic beings, referred to as morning stars and sons of God, witnessed the creation of the earth and celebrated the glory, power, and wisdom of God involved in the process. Before the flood, there was a fallen being. The Bible only makes brief references to fallen angels, as the vast majority of angels in heaven never strayed or turned to evil. However, some have made this decision, remembering that heaven was originally intended to be their home for all eternity but have now fallen from it. What caused all this to happen? However, we cannot deny the fact that angels possess free will, and their fall can be seen in terms of this free will. The book of Jude makes this point quite clearly in Jude 5 and 6. But now I want to remind you, even though you once knew everything, that when the Lord saved a people, bringing them out of land of Egypt, He then destroyed those who did not believe. And the angels, those who did not keep their original state, but abandoned their own home. He is kept under darkness in eternal chains until the judgment of the great day. Jude states that the angels did not guard their proper dominion. The expression proper dominion can be interpreted as both government and starting point. Angels were made specifically for the purpose of dwelling in heaven with God, worshiping Him, and carrying out His commands. They were formed to glorify Him, just like human beings. But these were designed to dwell on earth, while angels were created to live in heaven. Despite this, these angels abandoned their beginnings, which is another way of saying they left their initial location in heaven. Satan, who disguises himself as an angel of light, leads these angels and acts as the leader of this rebellion known as the Great Rebellion. It was an event in which Satan and a portion of heaven's angelic legions waged war against God and his angels in an attempt to overthrow God's authority in the eternal realm. The devil devised a plan to overthrow God, his creator, and he and the angels who followed him ended up being defeated in the conflict. We have an account of this in the words of Jesus, who was present. Jesus spoke of the glory and majesty he shared with God the Father before the world existed. John 17 verse 5, Now therefore glorify me, O Father, with yourself, with that glory that I had with you before the world was. Before the creation of the earth, there was God, and God had majesty with his Son. Jesus declares, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. As it turns out, Satan is much more than a red figure with horns and a trident. He is an ancient being with real spiritual power, which he uses for evil and his own selfish purposes. We fight, but not against flesh and blood. Paul said we are in a fight, but it is not against flesh and blood. Satan's kingdom is highly organized, with different areas and levels of authority, and its headquarters are in the heavenly realms. This is a staggering fact, but it is quite clear. The fact that Satan leads a highly organized kingdom surprises some people, but there are many clear indications of this in the Bible. A spiritual war began. It is a conflict between two kingdoms. One kingdom is ruled by God, the Prince of Peace, while the other is ruled by Satan, the Prince of Darkness. After being expelled from heaven, Satan and his followers compromised with each other and formed the rebel kingdom. In the Garden of Eden, Satan launched his first attack against God's authority on earth. 
Satan considered the earth his domain and saw Adam and Eve as God's invaders in his territory. If God created humanity to live on earth in order to establish his kingdom, Satan needed a plan of attack. When God created the world, there was a place called Eden. In the Hebrew language, the word Eden means joy or happiness. It was a place of provision where a man could meet God, according to Genesis 3 verse 8. Now, in the perfect garden, there was a special tree called the tree of knowledge of good and evil. God told Adam and Eve that they could eat from any tree in the garden except this one. Satan needed to destroy man's destiny, but how did the devil, the ancient serpent, get to Eve and use three strategic tactics against her? The first was the doubt. Did God really say it? Genesis 3 verse 1. You can almost hear the father of lies interacting with Eve. The deceiver then used his second strategy, supposition, making Eve doubt whether the consequences of her disobedience would actually result in her death. As God had declared, you will not surely die. Genesis 3 verse 4. The third and final approach used against Eve was temptation. God was disappointed because of her disobedience. They could no longer remain in the Garden of Eden. Adam and Eve had already made a mistake by eating the forbidden fruit. Satan's subversive counterattack completely overwhelmed humans. But God established a beachhead in the Garden of Eden, promising that the serpent's head would be wounded by the woman's seed, turning the tables on the tempter. Before expelling Adam and Eve from the Garden, God demonstrated his complete dominion over Satan. The first murder, Cain and Abel, Genesis 4. Someone pointed out that the sin committed by the first man led the second man to kill the third. Even though Adam and Eve were expelled from the garden, God continued to bless them. Eve gave birth to two sons, Cain and Abel, with the help of the Lord. They both grew up hearing stories about God and knew they had to offer sacrifices to their Creator. However, while the Lord was concerned about Abel and his offering, he was not concerned about Cain and his offering. This enraged Cain, despite God's warning for him to master sin. Cain deceives his brother, kills him, buries him, and completely disowns him, asking, Am I my brother's keeper? Afraid that others would kill him for his crime. God placed a sign on Cain to protect him, saying that whoever killed Cain would suffer sevenfold vengeance. Genesis 4, verse 15. Cain was punished by becoming a restless wanderer far from home and family. After being punished, Cain went to live in a place called the land of Nod, east of Eden. In this land, Cain built a city called Enoch, named in honor of his son. His descendants included influential people of the time, such as Jabal, the father of those who live in tents and raise cattle, Jubal, the father of all who play string and pipe instruments, and Tubal Cain, who forged bronze and iron tools. Genesis 4, verses 17 to 22. After Cain's punishment, the story of two families follows, a recurring theme in Genesis. Unfortunately, Cain's homicidal ways were passed down through his family line. We find a man boasting about his own violence, and by the time we reach his great-great-grandson, evil has spread. God's perfect design is only four chapters long, and already we find people delighting in bloodshed and disrespecting his plan for marriage. Before the flood, polygamy was also passed down through the line of Cain. Until then, a man and a woman were married for life. But Cain's descendants had many wives. In contrast to Cain's lineage, God established a new family tree, giving Eve a son named Seth, replacing Abel. Seth exemplified the same type of worship as his late brother Abel. As people began to call on the name of the Lord in connection with Seth, Cain's form of worship, which was proud, pointed to himself, while the humble form of worship practiced by Abel and Seth cried out to God, Jude 11, woe to them. They followed the path of Cain, rushed into the error of Balaam in search of profit, and were destroyed in the rebellion of Korah. It's no surprise that when God needed an obedient servant hundreds of years later, he chose Noah from the line of Seth. Cain's legacy was complicated. On the one hand, he and his family were really good at coming up with new ideas and ways of doing things, but on the other hand, they also had a lot of problems with fighting and harming others, and this seemed to get worse over time. This has become a symbol of what it is to be human, a struggle between our potential for great good and our capacity for great evil. In the generations after Adam, the world became populated, but it also became filled with sin. People were not kind to each other. 
They lied, stole, and even killed. During this period, men lived extraordinarily long lives, with their ages reaching into the hundreds. It was a different time, a time when humanity was still closely tied to its origins and the world itself was younger and fresher. Adam and Eve had other sons and daughters after Cain and Abel, and as their family grew, civilization was born. The Bible says that after becoming the father of Seth, Adam lived 800 years and had other sons and daughters, Genesis 5 verse 4. As Adam and Eve's children grew up, they married and started their own families, and the population began to grow steadily. In addition to Cain and Abel, Seth was another son of Adam, who also had descendants, including Enoch, Methuselah, and eventually Noah. Adam, the first man, lived to be 930 years old. Genesis 5, verse 5. Yes, you heard right, nine centuries. He had children who also lived extraordinarily long lives. His son Seth lived 912 years. Genesis 5, verse 8. And Seth's son Enoch lived 905 years. Genesis 5, verse 11. As the generations passed, each man fathered children and taught them about the ways of the earth, how to cultivate the land, care for the animals, and also how to connect with God. This lineage of people was special. They carried the seed of humanity's first union with the fallen angels. However, despite their long lives and profound wisdom, these ancient people were not immune to the problems that often afflicted humanity, such as jealousy, anger, and sometimes even violence. However, there was a man named Enoch. The book of Genesis chapter 5 gives us the first mention of Enoch. And this is a different Enoch, not the son of Cain. Genesis 5 verse 21. When Enoch was 65 years old, he became the father of Methuselah. As we know from the Bible, his son Methuselah was the oldest man recorded in the scriptures. When studying biblical genealogies, we discover that Enoch was Noah's great-grandfather, Genesis 5, verse 22 and 24. The Bible says that Enoch walked with God in an era when most of his contemporaries only had records of his birth and his children. They also fathered Enoch who is like a breath of fresh air in the history books. Enoch was introduced like the others, but although he did not live as long as some of the other men, his testimony is remarkable. The Bible says that he walked with God and that when it was time to leave the earth, God took him without going through death as we know it. Description of him is short, but meaningful and profound, which means something about his pure walk with God. His life has provided a model for so many people across different generations, teaching us to live for a unique audience. Quietly, he teaches us to passionately pursue close fellowship with God, knowing that as we do so, we will experience God in a new dimension. Genesis 5, verse 24. Enoch's case was the first recorded abduction as God simply took him. Perhaps the communion was so intense that God's presence enveloped him and carried him away. The book of Hebrews talks about men of whom this world was not worthy. And despite the beauty of Enoch's life, his was not entirely peaceful. People lived long, but not always well. They had many years to hone their skills, build things, and explore the earth. But they also had more time to make mistakes, stray from God's path, and let their hearts become hardened. This eventually led to a world so corrupt, so far from its divine origins, with population growth, expansion of tribes and families over time tribes and clans formed, each descended from one of the original patriarchs, spreading across the land and finding new territories to call home. As the population grew, so did the need for different functions and professions. People couldn't just be shepherds and farmers. It was necessary to diversify. Cain, for example, was a farmer, Genesis 4, verse 2, while his brother Abel was a shepherd. This suggests that even at this early stage, roles were being defined based on need and skill set. Tubal Cain, a descendant of Cain, became the instructor of every craftsman in bronze and iron. Genesis 4 verse 22. This indicates the emergence of more specialized professions, such as metallurgy. Musicians also made an appearance. Jubal, another descendant of Cain, was the father of all who play the harp and flute. Genesis 4 verse 21. These roles allowed society to become more complex and organized, setting the stage for more advanced forms of civilization. Even though people learned new skills and jobs, life before the Great Flood was neither perfect nor happy. The Bible tells us that the Lord saw how great was the wickedness of the human race on earth. 
and that every inclination of the thoughts of the human heart was only evil all the time. Genesis 6 verse 5. In short, before the flood, humanity expanded and diversified, families turned into tribes, roles became professions, and civilization took its first steps. The invasion of the Nephilim was orchestrated by the self-styled commander of the kingdom of darkness, Satan, who summoned his evil legions to infiltrate humanity with the intention of polluting the bloodline that would lead to the Messiah. Genesis 6 verse 1 and 2 When human beings began to multiply on earth and daughters were born to them, the sons of God saw that the daughters of men were beautiful and married any of them. The sons of God, as the book of Job characterizes them, are angels. Two-thirds of the angels were made with God in the third heaven, being elect angels, while one-third were expelled, becoming Satan's fallen angels. God's kingdom prospered in numbers and strength and feeling threatened. The prince of darkness summoned his evil legions to infiltrate humanity. These fallen angels descended to earth and generated the Nephilim or giants, a Hebrew word that translates as fallen or giants. This satanic invasion of Genesis 6 corrupted the entire world. The sons of God became the daughters of men, and it is more accurate to understand the sons of God as demons, angels in rebellion against God, or men possessed by demons. The wickedness of humanity was on the rise, Genesis 6 verse 1 to 5. In the first chapters of Genesis, specifically in Genesis 6 verse 3 to 5, the Bible describes a picture of the world before the flood. The Lord said, My spirit shall not abide in man forever, for he is carnal, and his days shall be one hundred and twenty years. The Nephilim were on earth in those days and also later. When the sons of God cohabited with the daughters of men, generating powerful and famous offspring, the Lord saw that the wickedness of mankind was great in the earth, and that every intention of the thoughts of their hearts was continually evil. The earth was not a place of peace or goodness, but rather one filled with sin, violence and moral corruption. Imagine a world where people are consumed by their own desires, always seeking to do whatever they want, regardless of the cost to others. Honesty, integrity, and kindness are not celebrated or understood virtues. Instead, deception and manipulation rule the day. Everyone is in search of themselves and the fabric of society is torn apart by selfishness and evil. In this environment, families are not sanctuaries of love and support, but battlefields of deceit and betrayal. Neighbors don't look out for each other. They seek to exploit each other. Governments are not institutions of justice, but systems of oppression, maintaining the dominance of the powerful over the weak. Now, enter into this chaotic world, an unusual development, the Nephilim. The Nephilim were special and not like ordinary people. They were very strong and larger than life. But they seemed to make the world's problems even worse. They were admired, feared, and perhaps even worshipped, distancing people from the true God who had created them. Their strength made them objects of fascination, but they were part of a world that was increasingly immersed in chaos and sin. It was in this context that God saw the evil of humanity, the spiritual and moral decadence. God was saddened by creation. Humanity, the jewel of creation, had gone astray. Instead of living in harmony with each other in the world, people were consumed by violence, evil, and deceit. God looked at his creation and felt immense sadness. The Bible says that the Lord regretted having made human beings on the earth, and his heart was deeply troubled. Genesis 6, verse 6. It was a divine sadness, a sadness so profound that it transcended human understanding. Imagine a parent devastated by the actions of a misguided but infinitely enlarged child. And so, in his great pain, God made a difficult decision. Genesis 6 verse 7 Then the Lord said, I will destroy and annihilate humanity that I created from the surface of the earth, not only man, but also the animals, the reptiles, and the birds of the air, for it saddens me deeply to see the sin of humanity, and I regret having done them. God was upset with the actions of the people he created and had no option but to heal a world that was heading towards chaos. Yet even in the midst of this dark chapter in human history, there was a glimmer of hope. A man named Noah, Genesis 6 verse 8. The world had gone astray, but Noah stood out as a beacon of hope, a man of integrity and faith, Genesis 6 verse 9. These are the generations of Noah's family.
Noah was a righteous man, blameless among the people of his time. Noah walked habitually with God. Noah was born into the lineage of Adam, descending through Seth, Enoch, Canaan, and several other ancestors who carried the torch of righteousness through the generations. Eventually, this lineage led to Noah, a man who not only carried the torch, but allowed it to shine brightly in his life. He was also a family man, father of three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. As a loving father and faithful husband, he instilled in his children the same virtues he carried in his heart. Despite the darkness around it, Noah's house was a sanctuary of piety. Even when God shared his painful decision to wash away the wickedness plaguing the earth through a flood that would drown all living things, Noah's faith did not waver. He understood the gravity of the task ahead and accepted it with a heavy but resolute heart. Genesis 6 verse 13 Then God said to Noah, I will put an end to all human beings, because their land is full of violence because of them. I will certainly destroy them in the earth. God considered Noah worthy to be the guardian of a new beginning for humanity. Noah did what God told him to do, even though the people around him mocked him or didn't believe something bad was about to happen. He spent years building the ark, warning people about the impending flood and waiting for the moment when God would seal him and his family inside this gigantic wooden refuge. As the heavens finally opened and the earth was swallowed by water, Noah's virtues became the cornerstone for a new world. His faithfulness and obedience preserved life. And from his lineage, the nation of a purified earth would emerge. Thus, in a world descending into chaos, Noah's light shone most brightly, testimony to the enduring power of virtue and faith in the face of overwhelming darkness. God's covenant with Noah, Genesis 6 verses 17 to 22. The ark was the sanctuary of Noah's family, a vessel to transport them above the waters that would soon envelop the earth. God told Noah to build an ark of gopher wood, make rooms in the ark, and coat it inside and out with bitumen, Genesis 6 verse 14. God provided Noah with very specific dimensions, designs, and plans for the ark. It was not an ordinary boat, but a special ship designed to save the last living beings when the world was flooded. Genesis 6 verse 14 to 16. The ark was to be 300 cubits long, Genesis 50 cubits wide and 30 cubits high, equipped with a door and a window, and divided into several levels. Converting the dimensions to modern measurements, this would be equivalent to 450 feet long, 75 feet wide, and 45 feet high, with one door and one window, divided into different floors. God said, this is how you should do it. Genesis 6 verse 15, Noah began the monumental task of building the ark. It wasn't easy. Many ridiculed him and questioned his sanity, but Noah had faith. As the years passed and the wood took shape, a magnificent ark stood tall an undeniable testimony to Noah's obedience and faithfulness. God also provided Noah with instructions about who and what to bring to the ark, his wife, his children, Sam, Ham, and Japheth, and their respective wives. Furthermore, God told Noah to bring two of all living creatures, male and female, to the ark to keep them alive. Noah was to take seven of every clean animal, male and female, and two of every unclean animal, male and female, and seven of every bird of the air. Male and female to preserve their species on the face of the earth. Genesis 7 verses 2, it's 3. Noah did everything exactly as God had commanded. We have reached the end of the video. Leave a like if you like the video and activate the bell. Help spread God's word to the world by sharing this video with someone who will also benefit from this video. God bless you.